Hello and welcome to ATARC's webinar series. Today, topic experts will share strategies that agencies can implement to alleviate the concern of the unknown and make operations more efficient. My name is Kirsten Patton. I'm a performance consultant over at Dale Carnegie, Tampa Bay, and I'll be moderating today's panel discussion. ATARC stands for the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center and is a nonprofit that facilitates collaboration between government, industry, and academia in order to accelerate technology modernization initiatives. ATARC provides ongoing opportunities for cross agency collaboration through on site interaction, learning, and market research. I would like to welcome all of our attendees at home and a special thanks to Shelley Scarpelli and the entire Fortinet federal team for helping us make today's webinar possible. This afternoon, we are going to hear from each of our panelists, followed by a Q&A session where we will pop in a few polls and answer any audience questions that you may have. So with that said, before we begin, I really want to encourage our audience at home to please submit those questions of your own in the Q&A section of this platform down at the bottom of your screen. And if you would like to receive your CPE credits, please be sure to answer those polls as they come about throughout the discussion. So with that, I'm going to invite our panelists to please come on camera and go ahead and unmute yourself. We're going to begin with a round of introductions. So share with us who you are, what you do, what agency you're at, and anything else you'd like our audience to know up top. Let's begin with Jerry Karen, please. Hey, Kirsten, good to see you. Uh, name is Jerry Karen. I am the CIO at the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of the Inspector General. My favorite color is blue. Um, <laughs> but I also am uh, the chair for the Zero Trust uh, Working Group at ATARC as well. Thank you, Jerry. Good to see you as always. And moving over to Ross next. Hi, it's great to see you, Kirsten. My name is Ross Ford. I'm with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and I'm on the uh, CDM program and also in the uh, Center of Excellence for the Architecture and Engineering Group here at CISA. It's great to be here. Thanks, Ross. Great to have you here. And Alan, let's go to you next. Sure, I am Alan Kukwain. I am at State Department uh, and I currently run two divisions, one that's focused on uh, business requirements for customers and the second on governance and process improvement. And you guys are like, why the hell are you here? Well, I also chair the small and micro agency CISO Council because in a past lifetime I was a CISO and it just stuck. So anyway. Excellent, thank you, Alan. And we'll jump over to, we have two Jerry's on this panel. So Jerry Gilbert. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Jerry Gilbert. Uh, can you guys hear me? I just keep just making sure. Yep. Perfect. All right. Uh, I'm the CISO for the a small federal agency headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, I'm here because Alan asked for volunteers. So. <laughs> well, happy to have you here. And our industry subject matter expert, Felipe, you want to introduce yourself next? Yeah, hello. I'm uh, Felipe Fernandez. I'm the director of uh, systems engineering for Fortinet Federal, and we provide uh, cybersecurity solutions for just about all the needs and, and, and whatnot for, you know, agency uh, networks and uh, age, uh, identities, users, devices, etc. Um, so just very look, looking forward to this discussion. It's, it's certainly something we don't get to talk about too often. You know, it's usually dominated by other topics in the industry. So uh, looking forward to these perspectives. Thank you all so much. Really excited to have you here. So we don't have to go in any particular order. I'm going to call on Jerry Karen first just to kick us off with the first question. But <laughs> I, I think you can handle it, Jerry. Um, that being said, if you guys do want to, um, you know, respond to any of these questions that we bring up, just go ahead and, you know, go, go for it. We don't need to um, be too prescriptive here about the order. So, Jerry, what considerations should agencies have for mitigating supply chain cybersecurity risks? Uh, you said you were going to ask me a yes or no question first. Um, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's 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 a it's a challenge um, because we we rely on vendors to provide our services, and uh, we could not do it without our vendors. So definitely um, doing the right research. Uh, we do some assist assisted acquisitions through GSA, which is very helpful. Um, 
I've also leveraged some uh, research in the past. Um, there are some vendors out there that you can provide certain information uh, to get some research on companies um, because, you know, some companies, you know, while they say, you know, I found that, you know, one company, while you think it's U.S. owned, um, actually, you know, the board of directors sits in some other country uh, after several layers deep of things. So definitely good to be able to do your research. There's a lot of um, places out there to do so. There are vendors that can help with it. Um, we, Like I said, uh, we like to use GSA for some of those things. They have pre-approved things. Uh, BPAs um, is also something best to leverage. So um, there's, you just got to utilize your resources. It is a challenge um, because uh, there's, there's a lot going on uh, in the vulnerability space right now. Uh, we're patching all the time. As you may realize, Patch Tuesday is not, it does not exist anymore. It's Patch Every Tuesday. So it's definitely good to do the research and uh, utilize the resources that are out there. There's plenty of them. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, some of our other panelists, what are your thoughts around mitigating that risk? So uh, from a small and micro agency perspective, I'll just say this. I mean, realistically, it comes down to also everything Jerry said is a spot on. But I would also add that it's about resources and purchasing power. For the smalls, I mean, you have about 192 small agencies. And if you think about the metrics, it's about 40 percent of them are under 50 resources. So they are going to be very challenged to do a lot of the, the work that's required to do a lot of the analysis that's required. The other kind of challenge that you'll find with the smalls is they don't have the purchasing power to be able to help direct some of the things. They may not have choices to buy the, the ones that meet all the appropriate scrim standards. They may be stuck using the, the, uh, the resources that they can afford. That's really the, the, the just, general basis of what happens sometimes. So that's why they have to lean on CISA as well as other um, agencies to do enterprise BPAs and, and other types of support. Yeah. Um, and Alan, you know, I'll tell you, it is, a, it is for both of you, it's a big task, right? CISA is right in the middle of that. We have uh, our information and communications technology supply chain management activities going on supported by the executive order, if you like numbers, 14017, right? And, you know, this is a, it, it's actually, I think the way they call it is reinvigorating this, this, it, this avenue of technology evaluations, right? It's, it's been around a long time, but we've heightened desire to actually re-engage in that. And, you know, that is not the only supply chain that CISA is interested in, right? CISA is, uh, you know, the agency that manages the critical infrastructure, as we said, right? So we have in each of the critical infrastructure domains, we have guidance that we give, uh, you know, the participants in there around various risks in their environment, right? And and that often involves, you know, managing their supply chain. So uh, I would say that the the I think the thing that made this come top before, right? This past a couple of years, where you know we had some critical infrastructure uh, vulnerabilities that are, that were exploited and made that really important not the least of which were software supply chain risk right and it it's just an example of our adversaries taking advantage of of, of what they can uh, living off the land going in where they can find weaknesses that are part of our normal services right and and then trying to exploit them so there's a lot of work to be done. And, uh, you know, we, we appreciate that everybody's in this game together are including, you know, we, we can't do anything without our commercial providers, as you said, right? Gerald said we buy, we buy our products from commercial product vendors, and that's primarily who we rely on for a frontline defense in, in building his products and delivering them to us in a secure manner. Absolutely. Thank you, Ross. Anyone else from the panel want to weigh in on that before we move to the next question? Yeah, certainly. Um, if I may, uh, I think some of the other things that we need to focus on is just collaboration on threat intelligence and, and sharing information about, you know, what we're seeing. So, you know, um, uh, products that are installed at, at, at certain agencies, you know, can obviously create uh, a challenge if, you know, let's say a certain vendor, you know, has still has telemetry with certain said product. Uh, and then the vendor starts, uh, you know, uh, experiencing some type of breach. Um, and we saw that, you know, uh, you know, with the solar winds type stuff. And so, you know, co collaboration between, you know, uh, one of the vendors who saw that, 
um, and, and also with the federal government led to, you know, being able to mitigate that risk or, or the threat rather, rather quickly. And I think that's something we got to consider as well. So when, when you're starting to incorporate vendor technologies into your agency, you know, it's important to maintain that relationship uh, beyond, you know, that point of sale or, you know, giving them a purchase order to share intelligence about what we're seeing, you know, what the products are uh, experiencing, what the agency is experiencing. And the same thing with the vendor. It's, you know, we, we take our responsibility as a mission partner very seriously. Um, and we make sure, you know, our customers, particularly the federal government agencies, are aware of what we're seeing, what's going on with us, so that way they can be prepared for any threats that, you know, perhaps we're encountering. You know, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, look, ATARC is a really great example of how this information and collaboration is is coming to fore, right? And, you know, CISA couldn't, without partners in the industry, we wouldn't be able to do our mission at all, right? We, we share information with the industry where we can about things we're seeing, and the industry brings its information back about the things they're seeing. And we get much better visibility and understanding of the actual threat environment by doing that, and about thing, ways to mitigate that, that, those threats, right? Absolutely. Thank you all for those insights. So Jerry Gilbert, I'm going to call on you next for this question. How do you think agencies should be collaborating with industry to address these priority areas? Or could you speak to what your agency has done? Yeah, definitely. So we, we collaborate mainly with CISA. And, and then um, I believe that these vendors should work more directly with CISA to help us with uh, managing these threats, specifically like when we talked about the supply chain, I'm a small federal agency, I got a staff of four folks. So it's 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 diff difficult for me to put a supply chain risk management strategy in place. So I count on the vendors as well as as as, as our partners in, in the government like CISA and, and GSA and NASA with their NASA soup. So that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, thank you. Um, other panelists, any specific examples around where you found collaboration to be extremely beneficial in this area? So, so if I may, um, because I run the, the small micro agency council, uh, to, to Gerald's point, when the scrim requirements came out, we actually all pulled together and as a collective of, I think, 40 people pulled together templates that the whole community could use. Uh, it was actually a, like a great show of, of, of what the community can do when it comes together to really uh, do this like um, big thing, if you want to call it that. And, you know, realistically for this, I think, uh, and the reason that that was so valuable is, again, because of the resource constraints a lot of these small agencies have. I mean, Jerry just told you, he's got four people and he's got to deal with all the mandates. And, and that really tends to be very difficult and challenging. But we need and, partners to really work with. And I want to say, you know, Ellen does a great job with the Small Agency Council. We meet with them um, periodically, right, and very often to talk about the things they need from CISA and to provide information that we can uh, on on the on the situation, you know, that situations that are going on in the world, right? Uh, and and I'll just say that uh, it, it's it, it's not only it's not the only interaction that CISA has with small agencies. Uh, my program, the CDM program, operates a shared service that helps uh, small agencies acquire uh, cybersecurity tools that would be really difficult for them to do based on their size on their own, right? So we offer them as a shared service, and we really do believe that they, that's a real valuable way uh, to get these uh, these capabilities, good visibility and good insight into what's happening in their environments. And that information is, is there for them to, to operate along with the big agencies, right? In the same manner, they get to see the same visibility through the CDM dashboards. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel like to add to that? Uh, um, I mean, I've chaired two working groups at ATARC and that's been extremely valuable. I mean, we have 20 plus um, agencies and 60 plus vendors participating in our zero trust um, working group. Um, there are a bunch of other working groups, but um, from the TIC 3.0 working group and the current zero trust working group, we're not just throwing out white papers and things like that. We, we're, we're putting out actionable things and templates like our cap functional capabilities model that people use and vendors go keep going, where did this come from? Because customers keep using it with them. Now vendors are using it with their customers. Um, but we're having actionable labs 
um, where we're asking the, the vendors, they've all had their opportunity to showcase their individual solutions, but now we're asking them for the integrated solution and not just like one, you know, demonstration, but multiple demonstrations of different pieces because we all may have different investments already that we can take advantage, that we want to take advantage of, but what are the day out of the possible? What are the different looks of zero trust going to look like? So, I, you know, ATARC's been a great avenue for um, a lot of good collaboration um, and a lot of good feedback and, you know, from the vendor standpoint with the government and, you know, it's, it's everybody comes together for a common good. So it, that's been great. Um, Ross mentioned shared services. You know, I'm a beneficiary, I'm becoming a beneficiary of shared services and those are great collaborations. Uh, for instance, um, the Department of Justice, we are, you know, uh, entering into an agreement with them to use SOC as a service. I am, I am actually very small. Um, as part of being an OIG, I wholly run our own systems, you know, to avoid things like conflict of interest and things like that. So, um, you know, I don't have the staff to maintain a fully robust SOC, or it would take me years to get to where the DOJ was, who has been certified by DHS to provide such services. And that has actually allowed us to um, move further along than we we're anticipating on some of our efforts um, around cybersecurity as well, as well as, you know, gaining the 24 seven monitoring that they'll provide. So, you know, those kind of collaborations and identifying those opportunities for shared services is a great thing. And it's something that we're actually engaging on in, in the throes of uh, getting put in place right now. So that's another good thing to look at. Yeah. You know, and I think that's thematic as well, right? What When I see the evolving technologies through the cloud delivering as a service capabilities, it, it makes it both easier to acquire services that are already developed instead of everybody having to develop the service themselves. And it gives the ability to, to provide meaningful services to a, a broad range of the size organizations, right? No longer does a smaller organization not have the ability to take advantage of that service because it's it's just a smaller delivery of the same service, right? And for your large agency where you have a federated large distributed organization, you may have many instances of the same service, right? But I think the real key here is that service delivery model really helps us uh, get capabilities in agencies' hands faster, and, we're, and we fully anticipate to see much more use of those service delivery model in the future. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to uh, add to that. I love the the theme we're going on about uh, you know making things easier to consume and, and acquire, uh, particularly for the less uh, not as highly funded agencies. I think another contract vehicle that uh, has been tremendously successful in bring, bringing these capabilities is EIS. Right. So now you know agencies have the ability to bring in services. Uh, consolidate some things and, you know, from tier one providers, we can also optimize, you know, whether it be, you know, when connectivity, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so not just cybersecurity perspective, but also, you know, holistically looking at, you know, providing a better user experience, providing uh, higher security capabilities um, with, you know, industry experts who have been doing this for, for decades. So, you know, getting that mastery of, of when, uh, you know, provisioning as well as cybersecurity experts, uh, in one contract. So I think that's another valuable one as well, along with CDM and shared services offered through GSA and others. Thank you. Excellent insights from our panel. Thank you all so much. We're going to pause real quick and put up our first poll question on our screen. So again, if you'd like to receive CPE, make sure that you respond to this. Do you expect your biggest challenge in meeting these priorities to be around shortages of people, adequate processes, technology, or something else. So we will have that up on the screen there. Make sure to respond to it. Okay, moving right along to our next question though. Let's start with Ross on this one. If you could kick us off, please. On the matter of human capital, how can agencies address their cyber workforce needs? Well, certainly every agency is uh trying to compete against a, a small, uh, although growing workforce, right? Uh, it's not only are the agencies needing to hire more skilled cybersecurity professionals, but, but industry is in the same situation, right? So uh, one of the ways that, that my agency has attacked that is we are built, we're building, you know, new uh, ways to uh, bring people on board um, and, you know, cybersecurity talent management system that we have uh, 
allows us to get people. Um, maybe not. They're going. They may not be hired as full employees in the United States government. They may be there for a shorter term, right? Uh, it's skill based. Uh, I'm on the GS schedule. These the people that are hired through the Southern Method uh, are hired based on skills, and, and they may not be there for a long term. There have been agencies that have been doing this for a while. You have term appointments. But this is something that SIS is uh, looking at doing to get the right people that they need for a certain uh, exercise or a certain uh, program uh, for, for the time they need it. Um, and, you know, my program, they, we've been using, I mean, in my organization, we've been using some uh, uh, pay, pay enhancements to enable to get people to, that, to be closer to parity. Uh, and I think all of those things are things that the, the HR and uh, work for the HR professionals are looking at enhancing, you know, acquiring workforce. It's not easy. I think one of the things that when I'm talking to people about, about joining CISA, I really do uh, talk about working for the best organization I can think of and great leadership. And I really do believe that. And I think agencies that, that have consistently good leadership and you know great reputations, they're going to, it's going to be easier for them to attract people. One of the things that my our leader Jen Easterly is all about is having it having a, a diverse workforce that is a very valued workforce. And everything she she says when she's in the in the world talking about our agency is all about an, uh, uplifting the, the employees to do the job they can provide. Them, the stuff they need to do the best job they can. And I think that is really important and it certainly has helped us uh, you know, acquire uh, new resources as we continue to grow. People don't realize we're a three-year-old agency. That's, you know, this, we're very young, you know, and, and, we and we've had to grow quite, quite rapidly. And, uh, and, and I'm really pleased that the workforce management is one of the things that, that is, uh, that's a high priority for our organization. Yeah, that really is amazing. Thank you, Ross. And any other panelists? Yeah, I can. Hi, this is Jerry. I can add to that as well. I think this kind of the human capital question kind of falls back to when we were talking about collaboration and the ability for a small and micro agencies to be able to use shared services from different organizations. For example, um, we're looking to enroll in ASAC as a service from the DOJ. We're also already enrolled in the uh, DOJ's assessment and continuous monitoring CSAM solution. We're, we're, we're partnered with CISA for the VDM platform. I mean, the VDP platform, we're also part, partnered with CISA with the CDB, CDM program. So a lot of the, I, I think a lot of these shared services that are being managed by CISA and DOJ and the Department of Homeland Security is definitely gonna help the smalls and micros in, in meeting our human capital restraints because I can't just go hire 20 folks to do yeah. the job. I only got the staffing for four. So, so that's kind of, and as, as far as like the quality of the, the, the individuals, the scholarship for service program is a, is, is a great program to get young cybersecurity professionals into the agencies. So just some thoughts. That's great insight. Anyone else? Yeah, a couple of things to play off what Ross said. Um, definitely, you know, the talent pool now is with with what we've learned uh, over the past couple of years. I don't have to hire within the Beltway. I can have people do it from across the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my my talent pool is uh, scattered across the U.S. I, I'm not confined to this hiring within the within the Beltway, um, which is which is hard because there's a lot. It's hard to find, you know. Um, some dedicated expertise in certain areas just within a short, small geographical area. But I can now, the pond is much bigger and um, I have the opportunity to look at other places across um, when, I'm, when I'm doing my hiring. The, the other thing uh, to, to what Jerry was talking about, definitely, you know, I did not, I do not want to be in the services of managing infrastructure. I don't want to, I don't do IT to manage infrastructure. I do IT in order to manage a business. So my thing is I'm always trying to get out of the infrastructure business. I don't get tools to manage the tools. I get tools for the output that they provide or what the functions that they provide. Um, so, you know, we're looking at things like not only as a service, um, uh, from from other agencies, for, as, such as SOC services and some of the things Jerry talked about, but you know where the vendor 
you know, manages the back end infrastructure and I get to take advantage of the front end infrastructure. And now I'm not spending all my time and my re my resources on managing that thing, upgrading that thing. It's being done by the vendor. I'm getting the advantage of focusing on what I needed for my mission in order to get out of it. So that's something I'm definitely working to try to get myself as out of the infrastructure business as much as possible so I can take advantage of the front end tools. Mm -hmm. Alan, you looked like you wanted to say something too. Yeah, so so the, the other thing that's funny is, you know, a lot of the small micros, they have folks that are double or triple duty in, in terms of roles. And, and it, make, it gets to be very challenging at times. But, you know, I think one of the biggest things we could do as federal agencies is we really need to, uh, hiring people is great, but I'm also a very big believer in mentoring uh, staff to bring them up the, the chain and train them like right now even though i'm not really doing any CISO work directly i mentor a lot of folks uh at smalls and either at some of the other agencies to help grow them to really be the future cyber folks that we really need because i think it's one of the biggest and best things we can do for 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 the the government to be honest with you because if we grow them into that field, it's going to be a lot easier than us just going to the beltway or outside the beltway and, and bringing them on. Anyway, just just my two cents. Oh, absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, I'd say from an industry perspective, you know, obviously, you know, we're trying to compete for that same cybersecurity talent as well. Um, but I, you know, I will say something I've noticed, you know, uh, the, the recent graduates, you know, the talent pool are, are coming out more readily than ever. Um, you know, Alan talked about, you know, uh, being able to coach people up and, you know, bringing them in, uh, you know, not as, you know, assistant level, but entry level and coaching them into, you know, the cybersecurity, you know, experts that they need in the future. And I think that's something we're really seeing. And that was something we were hurting in, I think, as a, as a nation, maybe a decade ago. Um, you know, having uh, graduates come out that were ready to be in, in cyber roles uh, or maybe just IT roles. Uh, but I think uh, certainly seeing, you know, a lot more readiness in that facet. Uh, but also something like what Fortinet's doing um, with free uh, training, right? So, you know, Jerry talks about getting out of the infrastructure so we can manage the front end. But how do they know what are the appropriate policies to set? What is secure? Should you allow access um, for this uh, with these protocols to whatever that is, that resource? And so, you know, what we're trying to do is help educate the cyber workforce by making our, you know, cybersecurity training free. Um, it's not just applicable to, you know, Fortinet technologies. You know, obviously the, the, the various applications and whatnot are ubiquitous for all organizations. Um, so the principles of the training, you know, are still valid. And I think, you know, industry and, and more vendors should be looking to do that, really uh, open it up, uh, let people educate themselves. Um, it, we're all better served for it, right? We're all invested in, you know, Jerry Ross's, Allen's and, uh, uh, success here. So, you know, I, I think that's something we're doing, very proud of doing, and hopefully we see more of that. You know, Chris, one final thought on the human capital side is I was on a call with the DHS CISO not long ago, and he was talking about how through automation, he's much better able to meet what used to be a human capital problem, right? Where his analysts were having, he had to have human analysts doing analysis of, of its situations. And I think he was really right. That theme about automation is gonna alleviate some of the challenges we have the human capital by making the people that are the people that are doing work much more effective because we have built tools and capabilities that are aid, that aid them in their work and they have a multiplier effect by being able to, to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for your responses. I'm going to go ahead and call for our second poll question now. So we'll have that up on the screen here in a moment. Do you feel that your agency has received adequate policy guidance to frame its implementation plans? So please take a moment to respond to that there. All right. Moving right along with our questions now. Uh, Felipe, I'm actually going to uh, ask you to start us off on this first one, on this next question here. Uh, what do you see is the role of the private sector when it comes to helping agencies implement their priorities? Yeah, uh, honesty, uh, we'll start there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to combat, um, you know, uh, some human uh, behavioral influences and, and, you know, and, but, you know, it's really, it's important, right? We understand 
you know, um, you know, the, uh, how important this is in terms of the matters of, you know, the security of an agency, security of the public and assets that are really important to our nation, right? And so, you know, that's something we, we hold our, you know, employees to a very high standard of integrity and making sure that, you know, when we're talking to agencies about what their needs are, what their gaps are and what they need to be filled, that we're only talking about, we're being, you know, completely honest about where we fit, how we can help them. Um, and we're also bringing in other partners as well. It's important, you know, at, we're, we understand what's out there, what tools are out there. We do a lot of competitive uh, analysis as well, and also partnership analysis. And so when we're, you know, we have the opportunity to, to bring another vendor to the table um, to, to help, you know, fulfill an agency's needs and, and really set them up for success. And it's really important for us to do that. So I think really just understanding, you know, the criticality uh, of the business we're in you know, um, I like to tell people, hey, good news, cybersecurity is as important as we wanted it to be 10 years ago. Hey, uh, bad news, cybersecurity is really as important as it is as we wanted it to be 10 years ago. And it really has, uh, you know, it, it can have, you know, really great things for our, our country to be successful, or we can have really grave impacts if we don't take it seriously enough. So, you know, for us, we just take it, you know, uh, it, it's, it's just the integrity of, of how we do things and making sure that we're listening to agencies about, you know, what's coming down the pike, what they're looking to implement. You know, I like to use the example of PKI introduction, you know, 20, 20 years ago into the federal government space. And, and you know, it, it started becoming, you know, something we were hearing is you got to support PKI, you got to support CACPIV, um, you know, and it, and it was kind of slow for the vendor community to take that seriously. But you know, that, that, that's actually a very tre a tremendous capability that we had to make sure we implemented it. You know, here we are finally, and, and it's pretty much in every vendor supports it in most applications, if not all. Uh, but that's just a small example. You know, there's a lot of other things that are coming up and we, we need to really listen to our agency uh, customers and, and really roadmap, you know, the gaps in our product. So we take that seriously. Yeah, thank you, Felipe, for starting us on that one. And then same question to our government folks. Um, you know, you don't have to like call out specific uh, people you worked with in the past, but what does that relationship look like when it's worked really well from both sides? I would just add that I think that uh, realistically, um, everything Felipe said was 100% spot on. We we as the government need to partner with uh, with the vendors and the vendors, you know, it's it's a collaboration. We really both are in this boat together when it comes down to it, and and we both have a a skin in the game to make this all successful. So, um, I mean, there's I can name a few vendors that that have definitely done that and have done some good jobs for, in terms of trying to make that happen. Uh, but you know, I think you think it was spot on. I mean, it really is a partnership, and that's. Yeah. It's really the best thing to, to, to really have. The, the other thing I would just kind of mention is not every agency has the deep pockets uh, or, or deep bench of, of resources to do a lot of the research. I, I think that's why the, the, the partnership is as, as very important. So, yeah. Thank you. I, want, I wanted to key on one thing Felipe said is what I'm seeing more and more of, which is beautiful is the vendors partnering together you know not coming in and showing us their 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 niche uh stovepipe solution and then me turning around and trying to figure out how it fits in my puzzle piece over here uh but they, they're we're really seeing more partnership between the vendors and how they work with this product that product or that product depending on what my needs are what my investments already are we're i'm seeing a lot more of that and that's very refreshing you know um and you know, it's not a one size fits all. Um, and but that partnership and showing the art of the possible, because I mean, it's an integration effort. It's not like I'm going to buy one tool and go, it's going to go sit in the corner and just do its thing. No, I have to do I have to integrate it into my whole infrastructure um, in some form or fashion, whatever it may be. So it's got to it's got to work concurrently within my architecture. And that just seeing naturally the vendor starting to really do that especially around when it comes to zero trust there is no one zero trust solution as we all know they're really partnering with each other to kind of bring together that suite of things of the art of the possible that will work together to get you through um the majority of all the pillars so that that's been something that i've been naturally seeing that's something that we're seeing in our working group as well 
um, different vendors are partnering with different vendors or integrators are bringing in the, the best of breed vendors and putting these labs together to work um, in an integrated fashion. So that's something that Felipe mentioned that I, I'm really proud and happy to see. Well, I agree. And you know, one thing the government can do to help uh, these efforts on, right? The government has a real interest in using standards where possible, right? And and those standards should be developed by the by the, the best of breed people in the industry, right? They should work together to come up with standards and then we can adopt. And there's a few things that, uh, that, that have come to mind recently in around the zero trust effort, right? So sharing policies across uh, different cloud providers is a really difficult thing to do now, right? But there, there are uh, elements that are developing. One thing comes to mind is open policy agent, which is, the kind of thing that I, that when I'm talking to agents, I ask them, do you support OPA, right? You know what I mean? Not that I can d direct them to do it. I'm just trying to influence people to do things that can help us get better, you know, cross cloud, cross service integration, right? Uh, not, to, not that I know that one's going to be a winner or not, but those are the kind of things I ask about when I'm talking to, to uh, my industry partners and trying to find out how they're working with other partners to try to build you know, it's a very distributed ecosystem we're building into. And to do that in a, in a really uh, great way is going to be difficult, but it's going to require a lot of, of, of collaboration between all the parties. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Any other comments here? All right. Alan, let's start with you on this next question then. Alan, what kind of new technologies or security solutions do agencies expect to consider in addressing these cybersecurity priorities? Uh, so you asked me the hardest question, of course. Because <laughs> I knew you could hear it. <laughs> well, well it, it's, you know, it's kind of funny because if you if you look at the standards and um, and the vendors that are involved, it's a, it's a it's a whole bingo card of names when it comes down to it. It really is. And, um, I mean, honestly, from a small perspective, um, I'm, I can't really call out one or two vendors that'll really do the things. But what I would say is that a lot of the things that we are talking about are based on the automation. That's really going to be helping to save our uh, save save our industry or, or the agencies a lot of the work that we have to do. Um, a lot of the AI tools that are out there, I think, are, are really making a lot of headway into really pushing pushing the envelope and especially with uh, any of the supply chain risk management you know when you're talking about mitigating attack surface vendor risk management code validation and, and even some of the geopolitics that are involved I think those, those automation tools are really going to try and help a lot um I really don't know what else I could say <laughs> to be honest but no, that was perfect thank you Alan um anyone else thoughts hey uh, yeah this is Jerry uh Gilbert I'd like to add also that that with the new technologies, you know, agency smalls are really specifically being asked to move towards the cloud. So like with these new technologies, we've got to make sure that that these cloud technologies are FedRAMP certified. So that that's that's a key factor because there's a lot of times I'll talk to a vendor and I'll, the first thing I'll, they'll say is, yeah, we're in the cloud. And I says, you're in the cloud, are you FedRAMP? And they'll say, no. And I said, well, then I can't use you because it's mandated that federal agencies have to use FedRAMP cloud services so that's just a, just something for the for the private vendors to be aware of that if you want to start working with the government you definitely need to move towards the fed ramp certifications that's it great point anyone else uh, i think a lot of people focus on identity uh, that's been in, in the works for a long time and there's nothing wrong with that and it is very important uh, you want to get right pe right data the right people at the right time but one of the areas that we're focusing on is data itself and doing that data mapping, understanding that data and understanding what that baseline is, what that flow is. So we could, cause that's what we're trying to protect at the end of the day. Um, so, and then being able to do data segmentation, I think is, is very important. So that if some data gets compromised, it's segmented from the rest. Um, so you, you kind of stop that lateral movement. So that's something that's very important to us. Um, I, I could go on forever about a list of other important things. Um, you know, Alan uh, mentioned automation. Automation is gonna be very important because we need to make more real-time decisions. We can't wait for the people in the sock to wait for the red blinky light and say, hey, Ross, what do you think it is? What should we do? And then have that whole collaboration. No, if it reaches a certain risk threshold, 
um, based on all the telemetry that you have and all the factors that you're bringing together, what's the action that you got to take? Um, so, you know, that automation is going to be very important. And I think that's where machine learning and AI are going to become important to understand what baseline is. So when that risk threshold is breached, the appropriate action is taken. So definitely integrating the telemetry, whether it be from the cloud, on-premise, device, application, uh, authentication, access, all that telemetry is going to add up to some kind of risk depending on the target and they show what, what your tolerance is, what you're going to allow. And if, the like I said, if the threshold of somewhat is breached based on a fact, one of those factors changing, um, that's got to be an automated fashion. Um, it can't wait for, like I said, the red blinky light, the analysts to sit around and say, hmm, wonder what it means. What do I do? And by the time, you know, it's a little too late at that point. So we got to be a little more uh, proactive. And so automation, um, integration, and definitely understanding the data, which we're trying to protect at the end of the day, I think I think is important. But I, there's a bunch of other important things, um, not to disparage them or anything. Um, but those are those are some key things. And you know what you just described is the way I look at the world these days. It really is through a lens that we call zero trust, right? So whenever I'm evaluating a technology that, you know, people are asking me what I should do about a certain technology or even a certain system they're introducing, I try to walk them through a flow of, you know, who's going to access this information or what system is going to access it. You know, what type of people are going to be in that? How do you, you know, what are you going to share information with? And I, and I look for architectural components to put, to, to put in that, in, in, you know, the security capability within that that uh, system, including things like if now if you if you found that an information is, is has been released, right? How are you going to mitigate that risk, right? So it really is taking a, you know, kind of a whole of view uh, of approach to the systems you're doing, uh, you know, making sure that you segment the data that is sensitive from data that's not sensitive, finding out the best way to do that through your controls you're gonna deploy, right? So is it gonna be uh, identity and access management? Is it gonna be segmentation of a network? Is it gonna be segmentation within a database? All of those things are relevant things to do. And, you know, and that's how you should make your technology decisions is you know, based upon the use case, the sensitivity of the data you have. And it, as Jerry said, an automation is really gonna help you be able to frame what you need to do, right? Uh, you know, and how you can do it as in as you put this system into operations. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your comments there. Anyone else? Yeah, I I I just like to touch on on all those points, uh, and maybe the the thing we can add to that is you know automation, data, you know, and all these things that only creates more data, right? And mm -hmm. so. You know uh, what what happens when you know the RPA developer contract ends? You have your automation configured. You know how to, how are you going to assess you know the data that's coming in and to understand if you have to create new automation you know capabilities? How, how do you know if you're seeing new things? And I think that's where you know AI enabled technologies really comes in, right? So if we're going to really enhance um, and keep up with the amount of data and transactions that are occurring, especially those that are happening because of the integrations we're, we're creating, because of zero trust that we're implementing. Um, we're going to have to have AI enabled, you know, products that are, you know, supporting that. So whether it be, you know, uh, diagnosing a WAN outage um, or finding patient zero uh, from malware, um, you know, being uh, brought into the network, you know, th that needs to be AI enabled tools. And so, you know, Fortinet in particular has been investing heavily in that area and deploying products, you know, as recently as just this week, um, you know, that have AI in them to help out with these uh, particular, you know, issues. Um, but that's really, you know, going to be imperative. If, if we're going to keep up with the amount of data that we have and, you know, that we're creating on the network, you know, we've got to be able to discover when new things need to be, new capabilities need to be inserted or new rules. You know, wh when have we gone outside of the norm? You know, what that, what's that standard deviation? Um, and so I think that's a, a focus. And, and we've certainly been hearing that, you know, from our mission partner, well, from the government uh, customer themselves, um, you know, it's really just those particularly who are consuming lots of data and there's no way to keep up, even after the automation, you know, it, it's really about, you know, okay, AI, let's talk about it for real, right? So, you know, I think that's really important as well. Yeah, thank you, Felipe. You're welcome. All right.
we will put up our third and final poll question on the screen now. And this is also last call for audience questions. So if you have questions, send them in now. Poll question number three, how well is your agency sharing tools and collaborating with the other FCABs right now? Okay, go ahead and respond to that, please. And for our next question, let's start with uh, Jerry Gilbert. Uh, Jerry Gilbert, how will agencies' security policies be affected by the new cybersecurity priorities set forth? How will, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yes, of course. Um, how will agencies or your agency um, security policies be affected? Okay, understood. I, I was, I, I'm just going to speak on behalf of my agency. Uh, so um, it, it, it's a challenge. Uh, like, for example, we had to put together a zero trust strategy and share that with OMB earlier this year. And as I put that together, I realized just like what we talked about earlier in, in this discussion, you know, the, the difficulties with uh, constraints on resources as well as, as human capital. So it's, it's definitely going to be a challenge. Uh, we can add it to our policy, but w whether we implement that policy or not, it's going to be dependent on, on how well we can use the collaboration tools that are being provided by CISA and, uh, and our other partners. I, I can't do it by myself, so specifically as a small agency. So it's definitely going to be reliant on on all the tools that are being provided from from our partnership with CISA and and DOJ as well as uh, DHS. Yeah, that's kind of that's it. Thank you know, you. one of the things I want to say when OMB asked agencies to put together a plan, it, they also said, and please let us know where you're having challenges, put that plan together. What are your resource constraints? They really seriously want to know so they can figure out as we're trying to go to the zero trust architecture, right? What do we at OMB need to help agencies either get in terms of resources or focus on providing resources for them, right? So I hope everybody was honest and open about that. Uh, because they really do want to know what are the challenges of doing this. It is a different architecture than what we've been existing in before, right? And and it is a, an active architecture, right? So you find components that you can make risk decisions throughout the architecture, right? And and I don't think a large agency and a small agency will necessarily approach those architectural constraints the same way. There may be ways for us to do more shared service delivery that could help with that, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Anyone else on the panel want to respond to that about how your agency might be affected? Well, I, I'll just say this uh, again from a small perspective. Um, smalls have limited resources, and if you do one or two mandates, challenges, etc., uh, they'll be able to consume it and, and deal with it. But the thing is, right now, I think over the last year. Um, if I kind of look at the mandates and the various BODs and, and the various different mm -hmm. guidances and things that have come out, it's been like a, a, a huge flood of re requirements that folks, uh, that the smalls have been uh, asked to to implement and, and do different things with. And, you know, that gets to be challenging because they have to then decide, well, what is the worst, best answer, I or best, worst answer I can give? You know, because it, it's hard to do everything. So they have to pick and choose which is the right priority for them. And I think that's going to be the, the the challenge you'll see sometimes with some of these agencies. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you, Alan. And that kind of goes into my last question, too. So um, for anyone who, if you wanted to respond to that, too, you can continue here. Uh, how does your agency plan to move forward with the new guidance laid out? So um who would like to take that one first? Take a volunteer. Uh, hi, this is Jerry again. I, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I'm just going to try to use as many services as I can that's provided from CISA and, and, and DOJ and DHS because if they're not there, there's no way that we can meet all these mandates, as Alan said. You know, we, we there's so many things that we have to meet. And so then, then it's a matter of, okay, focus on the priorities. So... And, but I do, I do believe that that for smalls and micros to survive, we're going to have to be able to count on on our, our big partners like CISA to help us with that and with those services. Yeah, That's it. Thank you. 
And All right. Go ahead, Ross. I mean, I'm happy to say that, you know, CISA just released our first strategic plan. And I think by executing that strategic plan will help with this, right? Because, you know, the first thing is to try to help build, uh, you know, build a zero trust architecture into the environment that we're operating in, right? That's one of the missions we have to help ensure that defense and resiliency of the cyberspace. And that really means, you know, helping the, the helping the helping this ecosystem we're operating in move to a new architecture, right? One that isn't just perimeter based. Now that's not easy. And and we have to we have to work with partners, those that operate government networks, and that's who the people here are. And we realize we need to partner with you in helping you deliver those capabilities uh, where it's not possible for you to do that organically, right? But also working, you know, with critical infrastructure, and that includes the people that are delivering software and services to the government, so that they deliver those those things part of their system, right? And not just to the government. I mean that that is part of the infrastructure that you can when you're buying products that they have defensive capabilities. That, that are built into them. So then Jerry doesn't have to go build a capability for everything he's trying to do, right? That'll help him, you know, get to a kind of a zero trust uh, approach to it. I think, I think that, and, you know, and CISA operating together, that's the fourth part of our strategy is, right? So that we communicate with each other so that when we're with the small, the small agency council, when we're working with critical infrastructure groups that we have, of you know the same vision that we're we're taking everywhere, and that you're hearing consistency from us about how to attack these uh, risks that we see in in the industry today. Thank you, Ross. Okay, any other comments from the panelists before we close out our or round out our conversation here? All right. Well, we will do our last round of takeaways then since we're coming up on time. So we've covered a lot of ground. I really appreciate you all sharing your insights and perspectives with us. And what I wanna do is I wanna hear from each of you. You have a minute or so to share what you think uh, the biggest takeaway from this discussion is if people leave with nothing else having, having learned from this conversation, I'm sure they've learned a lot, but what do you think is the main thing here um, above all else? Let's start it with uh, Jerry Karen, please. I think opportunities to collaborate are there. You know, uh, you know, we talked a lot about smalls, but um, big or small, we're we're all doing IT. We all have some commonalities at some in some instance or some way. So definitely collaborate, reach out. Um, you know, some people are further on journeys, you know, I've learned from reaching out that I know somebody has implemented a technology or further down the road than I am, definitely reach out to them and, you know, what did you learn? What are your lessons learned? Um, so I don't, I can avoid some of those things. Um, there are working groups such as we have at ATARC um, that, that are greatly helpful, I think. Um, you know, the government, it's, it's no cost to participate with the government and there's some great collaboration there. Um, you know, somebody asked me, uh, you know, to take a look at some of their use cases for their specific areas, and I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, my thing is help anywhere I can um, if it helps somebody else. So there's definitely opportunities to collaborate. Um, as, you know, Felipe was talking about, the vendors um, are, are really coming together and partnering. So um, definitely, you know, we we ask them, where do, who do you work with? What do you work with and everything? So start um putting that into your conversation um, um, into, so, so you can get that information from them as well. Um, but yeah, there's definitely opportunities to collaborate. There's forums to collaborate and definitely use your network in order to, to help. Yeah, well said. We have a really great community here. So just be willing to reach out. All right, um, let's hear from Ross next. So I'd like to say, you know, CISA's mission is large. And in fact, I was just thinking we were talking here that the emergency communication group within CISA is probably making sure the emergency communications down in Florida is operating pretty well right now, which is a good thing, right? So there's a lot of critical infrastructure that CISA uh, works in, including the government critical infrastructure. And I think one thing that I'm really proud about the, the part of the system that I work in is we, you know, we know that we know that we serve as both small and large agencies. We try to do that with as much, and uh, not looking at things as one size fits all. Trying to differentiate, and I, and I hope we can continue to help you get the small agencies the services they need. At, you know, where they can't give that scale themselves, 
but also meeting the needs of large distributed federated agencies, which do need, I mean, the most high powered services that we can provide, right? And we try to do both of that. I know my 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 leadership in my my section is really strong on doing that. And if you have any need there, you just reach out. You have liaisons at every at every turn that uh, that'll help. And and Alan, you know, you have to reach out to us anytime. Thank you, Ross. And Alan, what's your biggest takeaway? Um, so I would say this, being a CISO and being in cybersecurity is not easy, it's, especially now. It's not like what it was five five years ago. I mean, it's it's a lot more challenging. There's a lot more going on. Uh, so, so, you know, it, it, it's definitely a lot of fun, but but still a lot more challenging. Uh, the, a lot of things that uh, that Jerry and um, and the other panelists have said are very true. It's all about collaboration and sharing. I think um, that's one of the biggest things that we have to be able to do because why reinvent a hundred times? It, it's it's ridiculous sometimes that we have to do that, but we don't need to. We shouldn't have to to do that. Uh, FedRAMP is a great example of how we don't have to reinvent the wheel, and we should do that on a lot of other things as well. Uh, also, partnering with one another, uh, I think, is actually very valuable. And also with with uh, vendors to really kind of have it as a, um, a, a, a partnership where we can actually drive solutions forward and modernize the government, uh, you know, together. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to help everybody. The other, I think, is, is really um, the shared services are definitely going to help everybody. Um, and it's going to help reduce the cybersecurity burden that's going to end up being on a lot of the agencies when it comes down to it. And um, the only other thing I would say is I think also agencies modernizing away from legacy systems to uh, more low code type of solutions are really going to help uh, us as well. So, I mean, there's lots of different things that, that, that are in flight right now and are going to help us all. Thank you, Alan. Let's move over to Jerry Gilbert next. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I guess I just kind of echoed the same thoughts that everybody else just mentioned, collaboration and communication. Mm -hmm. I, 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 wanna, I wanna point out and, and praise Alan because he's kept this small agency, yeah. uh, CISO and, and CIO group together since he's left the small agency community. But uh, it, it's, it's an awesome tool that we use to communicate all the time. Everybody's always asking questions or looking for answers via the that community. So thank you, Alan, that's it. My pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Alan, I think it's a testament that people know that how did we do that this Alan wasn't here and they've, they've decided, no, we couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, hey, I mean, I, I don't, you know what it is? I, I re, I'm just a cat herder. That's exactly what I do. I just herd cats. <laughs> I just point people to the right direction or make the connections. That's all I do. <laughs> all right, Felipe, let's hear from you. Sure. Um, I think Jenny Easterly said this, and I'm paraphrasing, but uh, cyber risk to one of us is cyber risk to all of us, right? And, or something to that effect, right? And I think it's important um, that, you know, agencies and, and those who are looking to help agencies with their cybersecurity missions and supply chain security um, are taking that mindset, right? And it's really something that, you know, it's how they approach bringing value to, to uh, federal agencies and, you know, the United States government are, and our citizens overall. Um, so, you know, two limitations that we heard about, you know, are really under the same thing, right? Capital, right? Capital from a budget standpoint, capital from human standpoint, you know, so, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, uh, trying to solve some of the, for some of these things, you know, you got to think about a, a vendor or a solution, um, that, you know, takes that in mind, you're providing, you know, capabilities that be, can be integrated into the overall strategy for zero trust. Um, and of course, we talked a lot about cloud, but you know, as I found out this morning, there's a lot of non-cloud um, that's still going on in, in the government. It's going to stay that way for a while, just you know, depending on whatever that application was and that use case. Um, so those those um, solutions need to be taken into account as well. And so, you know, for us at Fortinet, we make sure that no matter what the use case is, cloud native, cloud first, cloud smart, hybrid cloud, multi cloud, no cloud. Um, that the tools that we have have what, what, what capabilities are needed for zero trust. And so I think, you know, it's really important for agencies and integrators and those looking to help agencies that they're really investigating the full suite of tools that they wanted to bring to the table and, and all the use cases that they can fit in. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Felipe and all the other panelists. This has just been such a fun hour. Of course, I have to recognize our partners again at Fortinet Federal for helping us put today's webinar on and you all at home for tuning in and everyone for wanting to help make the government even better. So please respond to the CPE poll and uh, let us know whether you'd like to have that credit emailed to you or not. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you all at the next one. We have an October 6th webinar for steps on acquiring and implementing AI. We'll go over the challenges and successes there. Um, that being said, please reach out to me if you want to learn how to get further involved with ATARC, like some of the working groups Ross and Jerry mentioned. Happy to help you there. And we also have resources for collaboration and communication across, um, across government and, and industry. So thank you all so much. Everyone have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you at the next one. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye.